Hey, good morning. Good to be here with you on a Monday. Yeah, Monday we're <laughs> launching into a new week. Hopefully you had a great weekend, got a lot done, and now you're kicking it into high gear again. I know. <laughs> but you know what? Every day is an adventure. Every day is just another opportunity for us to grow in our knowing him and knowing what it's like to walk with him right so good to be with you hope everything is going well good morning jack and robin susan patrick thank you guys i appreciate you jumping in to hang out with me as we get things underway for another week and uh you know here we are kind of in the waning days hard to believe summertime is just <laughs> it's already seeming like it's speeding away here but that's the way it goes shalom linda good to see you thank you um so we have been in matthew 16 over the past couple of weeks and um just really looking at some amazing stuff and today you know we're looking at an incident that occurred where you, you see somebody kind of go from the height of powerful revelation and encounter all the way down to about as low as you can get. <laughs> and it's just, it's a fascinating story for what uh, it teaches us, what we can learn from it. And of course, it all revolves around our old buddy Peter, <laughs> all right? Um, we had talked about how he received this awesome revelation concerning who Jesus really was as the you know the Messiah, the Son of the Living God, right? He's the one that that speaks that out when Jesus asks, "Well, who do you say that I am?" right? And so you know Jesus acknowledges him and basically prophesies you know that he he is someone that is you know going to be important <laughs> he's not the rock but he is a rock <laughs> okay so um after jesus teaches all of this and uh uh you know explains how he's building the church and the authority that they will have to to uh, you know assist him in that basically um he finishes up all of that. This is verse 20 of Matthew 16. He says, Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. Now, I don't even know for sure how much that registered with them. I'm sure they probably said, Oh, okay. But I don't know that they really understood why. Why would he say, don't tell anybody? I mean, this was the most amazing revelation. But, you know, we can look back and, and understand through hindsight and the rest of the scriptures that Jesus knew that if, if Israel was to, you know, rally around him and just say, oh, yes, you're the Messiah, it would thwart, <laughs> you know, the plan of God, which was that he had to you know, go to the cross and be crucified. <clears throat> so, um, verse 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. So he's laying out for them this plan that, you know, was decided upon even before creation, right? The Bible says that he's the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, before time even began. Yeah, it's just an amazing thing when you stop and think about that. You know, they the Trinity knew what they were in for, yet we are valuable enough to them to have this kind of relationship that they were willing to endure all the nonsense right and to to have jesus crucified and suffer unbelievably 
I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's really hard to wrap your mind around, but that's, that's the reality of it, right? So he's telling them all of this. And verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> now in Mark's gospel, he records that Jesus looked back and saw that the disciples were within earshot. He saw them, right? So he turns and says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, or more literally, on the things of God, but man's. <laughs> and then he goes into his teaching on what it means to be a follower, to be a disciple. He says, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And goes into all of this, you know, this teaching that we've we've talked about many times here in terms of what it means. But I wanted to just focus this morning on Peter and what he experienced. Because to go from being, you know, I'm reminded of, of the old Charlie Brown cartoon, you know, where he talks about being the hero one moment and then the next moment, the goat, right? He's the hero in the baseball game and then because he drops you know, a, a fly ball or something like that, he becomes the goat where everybody turns on him. Peter experienced that. He experienced the elation of realizing, oh my gosh, I got it right. God gave me something powerful. I, I understand what who Jesus really is. To go from the pinnacle of that kind of an experience to now being said, being spoken to, that you are Satan. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's spiritual whiplash to the nth degree as far as I'm concerned. So how did this happen? How can Peter go from one extreme to the other seemingly, you know, in, in minutes? I mean, we don't know how long Jesus was talking to them about the upcoming plans, you know, but it couldn't have been too long, right? And so to go from, you know, to have those extremes happening, whew, how does that even happen, right? So uh, Jesus really makes it clear where Peter went wrong in his statement to to him, right? He says that, um, you, you know, you're, you're a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests or on the things of God, but rather you are focused on what's best for people, for yourself, for the things that would be an advantage for you. And, you know, in Peter's mind, it was utterly illogical for Jesus to say, yeah, I'm going to be arrested and killed. <laughs> You know, to, to, to say or to understand that here Jesus is acknowledging, yes, I am the Messiah. You're right. You got that right. And then to, to say, yeah, but I'm going to be arrested and killed. <laughs> that did not compute, you know. And, and I'm sure it didn't compute with all the disciples. But Peter, emboldened by his you know, new stature as the, the receiver of revelation, his next thought is, well, that's absurd. That can't be God. <laughs> and so he goes and rebukes Jesus as, you know, what, what, this is crazy talk, right? But Jesus identifies it. He says, you, your mind is on the wrong thing. It's on the wrong things. It's not on the things of God. It's on things that are advantageous to you and to the rest of my followers. You want me to stick around because you can't see any other option. And keep in mind that they, I think they were still under the, the understanding, the, the theology that Messiah was 
solely going to be a conquering king. The picture of the suffering servant, right, of the Lamb of God that was in that, on those Old Testament prophecies, right, that's just as real of a prophecy as the one of a conquering king. But of course, Israel wanting to be freed from the, uh, you know, the, the oppression of the Roman Empire, you know, they're not going to look at, you know, a suffering servant picture. They're only going to see, you know, the conquering king. So Peter, I'm sure, still had that understanding. But that understanding needed to be challenged. It needed to be challenged because it wasn't correct. It was wrong. Yeah, it, you could justify it from Scripture, but you're leaving out other Scripture, other prophecies that are obviously just as valid. So, this idea of setting your mind is so important because <laughs> what it tells us is that we do have a choice as to what we're going to focus on and what we're going to believe. And Peter, when he was confronted with a, a statement by Jesus that did not compute, made no sense based on what he understood of the Scripture, decided, well, that's wrong. <laughs> okay, And he wanted to try to correct Jesus. Now, how does this apply to you and I? Well, there's there so much in the Word of God that challenges us concerning how we're going to approach or how we're going to receive things that God needs to tell us and wants to tell us that is going to absolutely challenge what we thought we knew, what we thought we believed, what we have been believing. Okay, All of us have our own mindsets and belief systems and and philosophies and whatnot that we've developed through experience through you know life through what we've been taught by others through our own study of the word of god we can come up with this whole body of of belief and and thought opinion concerning what is and what isn't and for us we have to be willing to basically lay that down and say, okay, wait a minute. I'm hearing something completely different from what I believed. What does this mean? What's going on here? Right? Peter's reaction, while I think we can understand why he, he did that, because it was just too shocking to consider, the problem with it, of course, is that when we elevate our understanding and our beliefs, our thoughts, above what God is trying to teach us and tell us, that's going to be a problem. You know, in, in, in the book of Proverbs, we have this very, very powerful uh, statement that's made actually twice in the book of Proverbs uh, fourteen twelve. There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. That's also repeated in, in Proverbs 16.25. So you have this idea that, well, no, this seems right to me. <laughs> well, maybe so. But <laughs> just because it seems right to you doesn't mean that it's, it is right. Okay, Peter thought he was doing the right thing. Well, this is ridiculous. You being killed? No, you're the Messiah. You're the king. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> oh, my Lord. You, you see the implication? If I hold on to what I think is right, you know, what I thought was the truth and, and my belief about that, but it's, it's wrong. I'm, I'm believing a lie. Who am I empowering? Who am I agreeing with? I'm agreeing with Satan. Satan didn't want Jesus to be crucified or to, or to, the, the outcome of that. I don't even, you know, I don't think Satan even really knew what the outcome was going to be. He just fig figured, well, if I kill Jesus, then, then you know, <laughs> I'm rid of him. 
in this earthly realm. But, you know, Peter's statement of, of rebuke to Jesus saying, no, God forbid, you are not going to die. What are you, nuts? <laughs> right? That statement was something that Satan agreed with. And so Jesus, in responding to that, it's like, whoa, get behind me. I, the, you, you have no part in my life if you're going to believe that. <laughs> okay. So it's serious. That's what I'm trying to say. This is a serious issue that we can have ideas and beliefs that oh, seem so right, but they're not. And if we're not willing, if we're not humble enough, right? Because, you know, another famous verse from Proverbs 16, 18 says that pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. Well, Peter stumbled. You know, his uh, thinking that, well, clearly I am the man of faith and power for the hour because I got that revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and he acknowledged me, and <laughs> right? I mean, it, again, it's a short step from having that awesome encounter with the Lord and that revelation to now thinking that, you know... <laughs> You you got it all. Well, no, we, we never have it all. You know, we always have to remain humble to whatever the Lord wants to show us. You know, uh, Paul brings out uh, very powerfully this idea where Jesus says to him that you're setting your mind on the wrong things, right? In Romans 8, he says that those who are according to the flesh, and that's the old nature, uh, the word flesh there refers to our life before Christ, when we, when we just did whatever we wanted, whatever we thought was right, okay? So the, the, those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death. But the mind set on the spirit is life and peace, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile, hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. So, you know, we are always faced with this uh, challenge when the Lord wants to bring to us another level of revelation that comes at us in such a way that it's like, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute, you know. Just even the things that Jesus says later on here, he says, you know, take up your cross, deny yourself, right? There are things that the Lord wants us to understand that are so gr much greater than, than our thoughts. You know, Isaiah points this out in uh, chapter 55. He, he prophesies the word of the Lord here. He says, the Lord says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways. You know, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so, if we want to receive all the truth that the Lord has for us, we've got to stay in a place where we honor and acknowledge that we don't know it all. We don't know. We just don't. There's so much we don't know. Even after getting amazing revelation from Him, that doesn't somehow put us in a special place where now anything we think about has to be from the Lord. Well, no. <laughs> it's like, in other words, we, we stay in a childlike posture. I love the, the, the paradox that we have in our life with Him. He wants us to grow. He wants us to mature so that we can function fully as sons and daughters. But yet Jesus put a child in the midst of His disciples and said, right there, that one is the greatest in my kingdom. So we're, we're, we're having this kind of constant balancing act where 
Okay, I know who I am in you. I know what you've given me. I know pretty much what you've called me to do. I've grown enough to see the vision and to pursue what you are, you know, what you created me for. But at the same time, I can never move away from a childlikeness where I am utterly dependent on him. You know, just because I know some things doesn't mean I'm going to operate on my own. But that's, that's the challenge, you know. <laughs> We're so used to living separated from him where it's, yes, I'm a born-again believer and uh, I love the Lord and I'm serving him, but I'm, I'm living as if it's me here and him there even though I know he's in my heart, <laughs> right? This is one of the major challenges that you and I are being confronted with in this season is learning the truth that we are never separated. He who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit. I'm going to keep repeating that scripture <laughs> until I'm blue in the face because that is where the Lord is, is leading most of us right now is just to learn what that is, to, to walk, to live, to talk, to do, to do whatever we do out of the reality of our oneness with Christ. You know, as Jesus said in John 15, we abide in him and he in us. And that's just being aware of that reality. And we're all growing in that. So there's a real childlikeness in this as we grow where we never become so, <laughs> I don't know, uh, think that we have it all figured out, right? That we start to live as if we don't need him. You know, Peter fell into that trap and we can absolutely learn from his experience. You know, another proverb that I think is so relevant to this particular topic is... Um, uh, Proverbs uh, 1, 7, and there's a bunch of these here. Uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. <laughs> Fools despise wisdom and instruction. And you know, when, when the Bible talks about the fear of the Lord, it's not this terrifying kind of thing where it's like you know, you're scared of him, but rather it is acknowledging, okay, you are God. I'm not, all right? It's like Stacey Campbell, when, when she was asked to, uh, to teach a, an august panel of German theologians, all she could do was sit in her chair, too big, too small. That's all she did, too big, too small. She was challenging our human tendency to think that we're all that. Okay, and so this idea of the fear of the Lord is just simply recognizing, whew, yeah, you're God, and I'm not. And, and to have that, where we allow him, where we want him to challenge us. Lord, would you challenge me in any area of my mind, my belief, my understanding, wherever I'm not thinking right, wherever I'm not believing right, <laughs> you got my permission. Challenge me in that because I don't want to end up inadvertently you know, coming into agreement with Satan as Peter did. So this idea of the fear of the Lord, which again, you can look all these scriptures up that are, that talk about this in, uh, you know, in, in the Old Testament. And there's, a, there's some of it as well in the, in the New. But again, this idea that hmm, no matter how far we get, no matter how much we think we know, <laughs> we also have to know how much we still need Him, how much we still need to embrace things that at first to our human way of thinking just seem crazy. And that's good. That is good because... You can almost use that as a test. Does it seem almost like, uh, what? <laughs> right? Okay, Lord, we need to talk about that. <laughs> okay. 
and not just immediately come against it. That's what the church has done, unfortunately. Every time God would restore a truth back to the church, going all the way back to Martin Luther and his 95 theses, that man was persecuted. <laughs> Why? Because he was restoring revelation that the church had lost. And throughout history, the church history from that time of Reformation all the way up till now, every time a new truth was restored to the church, there was tremendous persecution on the part of people who were part of the old guard. You know, those who, you know, who uh, carry the, the truth of Martin Luther's Reformation, well, well when God re-emphasized Pentecost, you know, at the turn of the 19th, 20th century, back in the early 1900s, with Azusa Street, the persecution was crazy. And then onward, every time you see truth being restored, there is this unfortunate backlash and persecution that takes place. I don't want to ever, I don't want to ever be part of that. I want to remain childlike. I want to remain open to whatever new thing. It's not, you know what it is? It's not new because it's here in the word, but it's new to me. I just never saw it before. He never you know, revealed it to me, but it's been there all along. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. Oh my gosh, I never saw that before. <laughs> but it's it's what happens. So I encourage you today to to do that, you know, to just come before him with all humility. Say, Lord, I don't understand it all, you know, and, and whatever you need to show me, whatever truth you want to reveal to me that I need to know, please do. <laughs> I don't want to ever be kept you know, in a place of deception or thinking things that, that the enemy agrees with, right? So, some powerful stuff. Powerful, powerful stuff, my friends. Wow. Well, let me say good morning to the rest of you awesome breakfast clubbers. Let's see who else we have here with us today. My goodness, look at you all. <laughs> um, wow, let's see. We got... Uh, Hey, Joe, how are you? Boy, it's been a while. Cindy and Marcos, Jane, good morning. Andrew, uh, D. good afternoon. Ted in Germany. <laughs> uh, Donna, Gail, Ralph and Rosa, Fred, Allison, <laughs> John, my goodness. Patty, good morning. Jackie, good morning. Uh, William, Judy, <laughs> Lord have mercy. Carol, oh, you guys are doing doing me so nice to, to be part of this. I appreciate it so much. And I do thank you, all of you that are sharing this with your friends. That's why I'm seeing new names pop up here on the, uh, on the uh, Facebook stream. Thank you so much. As always, please feel free to reach out if you'd like to chat or if you have questions. I'd love to hear from you, email or Facebook message. Have an awesome day. I really pray you have a chance to uh, love on somebody really big and just show them how awesome our Papa is. And uh, look forward to seeing you tomorrow. All right. See you then.